nominations for the chair for the Overview and Scrutiny Committee? I'll, I will nominate Councillor Cashman. Cashman. <coughs> As that councillor isn't present, uh, we need to see whether or not the councillor is prepared to be at the chair of the meeting. But I then proceed in the absence of any other nominations to appoint the vice chair of the committee. I'll move uh, Councillor Captain Wainwright. Will I second that? And I will also move Councillor Holland Murphy, because we have two. Two deputies, yes. Second I'll second that.
that, that can be looked into. Uh, what I would say to that is it, it only, only last year it was, it was actually moved from two members to three members. Um, I'm not, I, I can't for the life of remember why, why that happened, but we, we, we were originally two members of each authority, plus the uh, plus independent, oh sorry, opposition members. Oh, that, that wasn't the, the question. The question was, sure, we're not the member the man from all each authority, it's the quorum of this committee is set up 14, and normally, you know, you'd, you'd have a third, might be a quorum, but it's, it's an extremely high quorum setting for any meeting chairman. Now, if this is impacting on governance throughout the rest of the combined authorities in the country, there's something wrong somewhere with uh, legislation, the way governments have imposed this rather high quorum. <coughs> so, are governments debarring people from representative from being truly representative? Councillor Murphy. Mr Chair, <coughs> yes. Um to Councillor Lashen's question, there was a report done by the Centre for Public Scrutiny saying that there is an issue in other areas as well. And I think that the, the last meeting with the very chorus, um, there was a, a question raised as to whether this could be raised through the government to get the rules changed. So we're <coughs> also trying to say that we never get these um, ridiculous rules. The only the only part of it that makes sense to me is that it has to be over a number of authorities and that is more authorities. The number itself, I'm not quite sure where that comes from, whether it's a statutory instrument or a statutory instrument, I'm not quite sure. But, but we, will, uh, we, will, we will look at it. The uh, quorum is set by national legislation. The representation is all being made about that. And if it will help, I will prepare a note with, in conjunction with Jill about uh, where we are in relation to the other combined forces <coughs> and where we are in relation to making the representations of the government. Anybody else want to say anything on that? Another substitute. 
certainly let the crew. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'll just pick up a couple of things that were uh, mentioned earlier, this housekeeping. Um, quorums are to the SI. Um, we have said that it is absolutely right, and we've made representation to government to say that the threshold is very high. It's two thirds. Um, every other scrutiny committee in the country, other than command authorities, is a third. Um, and why does that matter? Well, you might remember those um, who are returnees, welcome back, a couple of new members. I did say that I thought this particular committee and scrutiny in general is the most important function of the command authority. Um, for me, anything that you want to see, we will ensure that you see it. And that is so that none of the nonsense that sometimes <coughs> happens in other forums or fora uh, can happen here. So, for me, scrutiny is integral to everything that we want to do. And uh, you might have seen that we got something called a qualified um, uh, uh, audit. And we only got that through our processes um, because of this committee. So um, all the other things, so value for money, for instance, all of the, the financial side of things, everything was all spot on. But because it wasn't scrutinised, because the committee wasn't called, it became a qualified uh, decision. And, and really that's disappointing because we've done everything that we possibly can so that we can say, look, look, look how good we are as a command authority, look what we do in government. And, and through no fault of many of the people here, because I know there's very regular attendees here, um, but there are some who haven't attended anything other than the first meeting. Uh, and um, certainly from opposition parties, that's a huge disappointment. That's not a political style, that's the reality of things. I think if I was an opposition member, this would be the one thing that I would attend on a regular basis to try and get to the bottom mm -hmm. of some of the complexities of what a combined authority is all about. Um, on the second bit um, about the Brownfield Register, and it's great to see um, um, one of my former parliamentary colleagues who's here, but uh, the Brownfield Register was published and it's online, you can get it on the Combined Authorities website, but that was to identify, it was part of the, uh, the, the formal process through the government that we had to comply with, um, but we would have done it anyway, we, we believe in Brownfield uh, first approach to development in the Combined Authority, and everybody can go to it, so it's there, it's uh, for everybody to see, I think there's 380 or approaching 400 different sites throughout the whole city region. But again, um, if you want any further information or if you want that link sent to you, just ask the, um, the, the committee services here, if you like, and they'll provide you with anything that you want. So, um, in regard to what's happened since we last met, um, there's an awful lot. I, I, I won't go back over this stuff, if, if you'll forgive me for new members, that we've done previously, so there's an awful lot that's happened. But since the, the last time, um, we've um, probably secured in total over £500 million pounds of new money for the city region. And that funding uh, we wouldn't have received if we didn't have a Metro Mayor and a Combined Authority. It just wouldn't have been available to us. And if you have a look, even with Combined Authorities, um, some have received things like uh, transitional, um, transformational funding um, and others haven't. So we've been, I think, fortunate that we've been able to persuade government that we, despite the, the, the problems that we've had with quorums and that, but that uh, we are uh, an organisation that has the, the highest levels uh, of priority and scrutiny. Uh, so much so that there might have been an announcement that went unnoticed, but it's really significant. 
and that is that when I uh, was first uh, elected, we had a 75, 25% split <coughs> in capital revenue, and that really constrained us. 25% of revenue uh, wasn't enough to develop some of the things that we wanted. Actually, we, we, had, we were sort of much more rich on the capital side than we ever had been on the revenue side, and we needed something to build capacity. So I uh, approached government uh, in the first few days and said, could we have some flexibility around that? Uh, and he said that we basically had to prove ourselves. Well, the announcement recently is that we have this flexibility, so it's now 60-40. And what that means is that there's 22 million pounds more now that we can use to build the capacity. It's a really good news story for us. It shows you how far we have come already in this process. So some of the announcements, and people will be aware that um, I saw that ma a manifesto, which was unashamedly a socialist manifesto, and it was about trying to see what we could do within the constraints of the powers and of the revenue that we were getting at that stage to really affect change. And the, the one on um, apprenticeship bus rates, I think, will have come uh, as um, something that is uh, an issue and supported right away across the political spectrum. And basically, um, a piece of research was done and it identified that the major hurdle to many people from working class backgrounds getting apprenticeship opportunities was the travel cost. And if you're in a, a, an occupational area that you have to travel around, and as people know, I'm from the construction industry, um, when you build something, that's it, you have to move somewhere else. And so the cost of that travel is really prohibitive. In fact, sometimes it's more than 50% that the total wage that people get in our allowance was spent on travel. So we came up with uh, an agreement with um, the uh, Alliance, the Bus Alliance, uh, the even stagecoach and ourselves, and we've now implemented half, uh, half price bus travel for new apprentices. It's only the start of what I want to do. You can imagine how far I want to take this, but with the limitations that we currently have, this is a finished step along the, the road of, of trying to uh, look at having a more fair uh, fair system. There's the uh, Bus Services um, Bill um, Act, in fact, in 2017. Uh, I think, John, you were still there, were you, when this went through? Um, but the, the, that bill does give us some further opportunities, and we'll be looking at what the uh, implications of that might be for us as a combined authority, there are different <coughs> options where we can take greater control of our bus network. And I obviously wanted to do that. I, I believe um, that deregulation was an unmitigated disaster. If it was such a good thing, then the likes of Boris Johnson, when he was the Metro Mayor, sorry, when he was the Mayor of London um, for two terms, he would have deregulated the bus service and would have won it surely. Um, being a free marketeer. He didn't because it knew it would cause chaos. So why do we have to put up with chaos uh, in our area? It's not actually chaos. I think we, we do rather well, we do much better than lots of other areas. But um, principally, we now have the opportunity to look at how we can re-regulate service and take greater control of the buses. That's part of the overall integrated transport plan that we have. And that makes something that you want to look at in the next session. Um, pull it together, buses and our trains and even our ferries, but walking and cycling as well, making it uh, truly integrated. Um, I always think it's, uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit ridiculous, isn't it? And sometimes you can pull up a, a train station um, when your train's just left two minutes earlier on a bus. Um, we want to be the other way around so that you can get to the train station and get off the, the bus onto the train and that may encourage more people to hopefully get out of their cars and um, also tackle some of the issues that we've got with air quality and that's another big uh, issue I know and this committee's already started to look at their air quality issues. Um, and so we'll, in regards to our bus fares, for young people we now have some of the lowest in the whole country. Uh, I think that's um, something that we all should be very supportive of. Um, and buses, make up 82% of all public transport journeys. So whilst we do concentrate an awful lot on trains, and I'll come on to that later, actually buses is really important to most of the people that we represent in the city region. 
They also announced um, something uh, on town centres. I was very aware how after they're going over to the Wirral um, after the new ferry bomb um, or explosion, should I uh, say. But I went over there and I saw the devastation and you know the, the government did I was going to say very little, the government did nothing um, to really help those people out in that. So we were thinking about how we could affect change in uh, town centres, not just the public in the world, but across the city region. And people will remember during the election that I did say no one left behind. So we wanted to try and get some money out as far as we possibly could. And we've announced uh, that each of the, the brothers will get a million pounds to look at a master plan for that town centre, or for two town centres if you want it, for each local authority to spend that money as, as they wish. But the idea is, uh, to give some or, or autonomy to local authorities to look at master plan and build capacity so that we can then try and get additional help and support and maybe um, pots of funding when they become available to help um, each of those districts. And because that um, went out quite well, I agreed with Mayor Anderson that we'll look at district centres in Liverpool as well, so that's something that we're uh, doing some further work on. But again, um, whilst the Liverpool City Centre is doing quite well, I think if you go around and see the retail offer there in some of the areas like the one I used to represent in, in Liverpool Walls, if you go to County Road, you'll see the main corridor, the main thoroughfare there, it's absolutely full of um, takeaways and payday loan companies and charity <coughs> shops. And, and we need to be thinking what these um, former district centres are for now in a, in a very changing world with online shopping and all those sorts of the pressures that we have. So we, um, we're, we're hoping that we'll be able to announce um, some of the uh, areas that will be um, chosen by local authorities to work with a town centre commission that we're coming up with. And uh, hopefully, hopefully those things will be the catalyst for some of the change uh, in those areas. We were also, I think, lucky that we agreed between the local authorities to um, to look at homelessness and uh, rough sleeping um, as a combined authority. Uh, I took some doing to the responsibility still lies with local authorities for um, delivering services around homelessness and rough sleeping. But we secured £7.7 .7 million pounds from the national government for something called the Housing First approach. Again, it might be something that you want to look at. Housing First is, um, is a, a well tried and a, a very well received approach to tackle those issues. And Crisis, um, an organisation in the EU and DCLG as was, um, funded a report, and that report was the six districts. It was Mind authority area, so we've already had that piece of work done. Uh, How's the first <coughs> report again? Which, you, if you want to, you can get the link to, and, and that gives us the basis really for trying to tackle this as a command authority um, through the delivery arms of our, our local authority areas. It, it's something that no area can do on its own. The competency of rough sleeping is in Liverpool, we all know that. But people from Bayern Air travel to Liverpool, people from Kerry travel to Liverpool. So it needs um, a cross border approach, and it's like anything to do with the environment. You can't draw lines on maps and just say, well, we'll, we'll tackle up there because this thing will sort of transmogrify or go across different areas. So um, we, we've, we've already started to work with our six local authority areas to build up some of the fantastic work that they're already doing and to get that across border approach and um, a draft implementation plan is being drawn up as we speak. Um, we've already seconded a member of the crisis team who was one of the architects of the report. I think that's always better. So there's somebody who's come up with the, the strategy to tackle it. Okay, how do we implement that? How do we bring that uh, real work? We also, on the to come trains, we um, uh, opened the new Golden North station, which is the first fully new build um, station for over 20 years, I think, on the Major Rail Network. And that was £13 million. And it's not just the, um, the 
the facility itself to get trained. So what that will do is that will act as that catalyst that I was speaking about earlier to build 1,700 new homes in that area and for people who can easily travel and commute in and out of work. So I think that will, um, that money will see a huge economic return for the city of Newton. <coughs> as well, you'll we have seen on Friday that the combined authority, Mersey Rail, and the RIT were able to reach an agreement in principle on a uh, certain number of staff on board the new Mersey Rail fleet when it uh, was introduced in 2020. And I did say right from the very start, and don't forget this is a legacy issue, I came in and this was already all, all done, but I came in and said that the only way that you can ever tackle any of these sort of disputes is by negotiations, by sitting around and talking to each other. And eventually we got facilitated talks to ACAS and the party set down, and that just resulted in what happened with the memorandum of understanding on, on Friday. I think it's huge progress. But all of that, I think, has been, in some ways, a diversion from us being able to tell the story about what we've been able to do. So in our combined authority area, these brand new trains will be the most sophisticated in the country. The platform and the train, the interface between them, when the train comes in, is absolutely level. So for accessibility and uh, for people with disabilities, these are a godsend. They don't need somebody now to be running out with one of those yellow ramps to put onto the step to get people on and off trains. It does um, improve people's uh, health and well-being in regards to being equal members of society. They're not being treated special. They're just, they can get on and off every time they want. Even if uh, you've got a buggy or a bike or whatever it is, just to get on and off, or if unfortunately you, 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 you're a fool and you're 56 and still thinking you can play football and you get a bit, bit of a, a bad back and you can't get on and off the train as easy with the step, these are going to be absolutely fantastic for people and uh, they will be owned by us. We are the first in the whole country to own our trains. It's about half a billion pounds that we've invested. Again, we'll be able to get onto the benefits of what we've now been able to do. What able to achieve as a transport authority and a combined authority uh, in this respect. And I think it's a good news story. And um, if anybody wants to see it, there's a mock-up train that's going to go around the city region. And you can go on it and, and, and see it for yourself. If you've been on the district line in London, where they don't have that compartmentalisation, where they're open, that's what our trains are going to be. So from the front to the back, you're going to be able to see it right the way down. They'll have Wi-Fi, they'll have a charging ports, all, all the, the best things that you can ever want on a train system. Um, we will have in our city region. It should be something that I think quite widely that everyone's very proud of. And um, I explained what was happening to the leader of the Labour Party when it came to uh, Liverpool on Monday, who was delighted with the progress that we've made. Um, that alongside what we're trying to do with Northern Powerhouse Rail, as you might have heard, Crossrail from North, as we like to call it. Um, that will mean that Liverpool City region will start to be at the forefront of the, uh, the revolution, <coughs> the new revolution in train travel. So, uh, what's the space? I'm going later today to Newcastle to the Convention of the North, and I'll report back to the committee following that on any progress that we can make. So, Chair, I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the update on that, sir. Can I ask on the apprenticeships? When, when was the, the free travel likely to start? How long will it last? Are we talking the length of the apprenticeships? Because apprenticeships are, in fact, they, they barely know. They can be for 12 months, they can be as long as four years. And you did say the, we have the cheapest. <coughs> Uh, travel in the whole of the country for young people. What we also have is the highest short hop first in the whole of England as well. You know, so there has to somewhere to strike a balance on this. But we're certainly heading in the right direction in particular, you know, trying to get young people on public transport and staying and getting these apprenticeships and becoming skilled and not being able to drop out due to the lack of first. Okay, I think it's a 
Shall I answer? <coughs> Shall I answer one, one by one? Yeah. Um, but again, I, I can't pick it up on anything you spot on with the analysis of, of, of that. Um, the bits that we can influence now, we're trying to do, but we will have a lot more influence when we go through this the sausage machine of the piece of legislation that's come through national government. Um, and believe me, we're not the only ones in Manchester, uh, Greater Manchester, that are looking at this as well. So we're all looking at what the implications of that, that might be. But you write um, 16 to 25 year olds now, um, it is the, the cheapest in, in, in the whole country. But on, alongside that, we also have the most generous concessionary travel scheme again in the whole country. So we don't do that because for those who are 60, um, they get free travel um, across all the, the, the modes of travel in our city region. Uh, well, other than Halton, because Halton don't pay that at the moment, but we'll, we can tackle that one hopefully in the future. But in, in Merseyside, if you like, we do. Um, and, and that means that um, people at 60 instead of 67. <coughs> but we, we need to look at the viability even of that because it's costing us a, a huge amount of money and everybody here knows that we're getting hit the same as you're getting hit as local authorities because of austerity at the government. So we're drawing things like um, the, uh, the rail support that we got, uh, £800,000 a year. So it's about £64 million to 2028 that we'll have withdrawn from that. We have to find replacement funds because we have to run the service and we want to improve it. So we're looking at, at what we can do on that. The question on the length, the duration, is uh, exactly how you've um, set it out. Apprenticeships now have a minimum length of, of stay to tell you the suit, which is a good thing because as you know, previously, eight months, you could be an apprentice. Then you went an apprentice. All they did is use work-based training and rebadged it and called them apprentices, and that's why you have that boom in the apprenticeship numbers. They're not real apprentices for me. Apprentices, uh, uh, the gold standard for me is level three, but apprenticeships can be level two, which is the precursor to go on and do your level three. Uh, and then you can do level four. I went to see one the other week, which is level six and seven. Uh, apprenticeships, they are degree and master's level uh, apprenticeships. That's where we need to be heading. So it's anybody who's on an apprenticeship. And the way that we can uh, administer that, uh, that is to uh, an online portal because we, are, we also want to do our part in conjunction with this is to make it easier for people to access apprenticeship opportunities. So we're going to have an online where any apprenticeship. And we're looking at perhaps skills opportunities, maybe even jobs and employment, but where they're on one site, a Liverpool City Region Combined Authority website that does all this, it's all singing, all dancing. If you go on that and you get by the apprenticeship opportunities, it automatically registers it for the travel. So we want to make it as easy as possible for these young people because we want them to take up these um, job opportunities in the apprenticeships. I don't know if you're aware, um, in the last quarter in the Liverpool City region, the drop off because of the apprenticeship levy was 58%. So, more than half of the people who, in the previous 12 months in the same quarter, would have been starting apprenticeships were denied it because of the introduction of the apprenticeship levy and the way it's been introduced, not just the principle. Councillor Burns, Councillor Hurley, and then Councillor Murray. Councillor Murray. Thank you, Chair. It might have a question, mine's just a thank you, really. I arrived this morning by using the Gold Lord station. It used to go 25 minute walk to the other station, now it's a three minute walk. So for us on that side of the Gold, it's an absolute consent, so thank you. Uh, the only apology I'll give is to you, you, you fit this, your steps on <coughs> as good as these do. Patrick. Actually, just following on from the, 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 the words about the gold station, I've been to see those, um, those new trains. They look fantastic. And the wheel of access from the platform onto the train is as smooth as you like. I want to know about the nature of the investment that's needed built infrastructure of the stations themselves, because not all of the platforms are on the same level. So although the, 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 the model that I've seen on the train is as smooth as you'd want it to be, that's not going to be the case in every single station. And, then, and the stations 
in the world that I represent, uh, Mersey Road and St. Michael. The only way you can get to the platform is by steps. So if you've got a body or you're in a wheelchair, it's great that if you can come off, off the trail off the platform, but then you've got to go up 20 foot of steps, maybe 50 steps to get up. So what can we do about the investment needs in the building infrastructure for the stations and take advantage? Okay, I think there's two questions there, and I'll, I'll try and separate them. Um, in regards to the infrastructural investments in platform um, improvements, we're, we're looking at what the best solution to this will be, but it's not cheap. And in the original business case, we put between 20 and 30 million pounds uh, into that pot for platform uh, improvements and, and to, to to them. The difficulty in all this is uh, we don't have full control over how much those platform uh, changes and improvements will cost because network rail are the only people that can get to do this. this Attention please. Um, we are about to relent the success of the fire so alarm system. Do not take any action when you hear the alarm message. But we're not allowed to. So Network Rail will decide what they think is the right price for these works. I'm going to London on Monday to meet uh, Chris Grayland to actually put this question to say why should we be held um, hostage to somebody just saying no, we think this is going to be and what other figure they come up with that's the figure that we have to pay and we can't go somewhere else, there's no alternative for us um, so it is a concern to us but we have that contingency in the world of that tension the second part, <coughs> and by the way, and that means that every platform on the, on the network is waiting for further announcements the station improvements, I think that's a legitimate uh, concern of us all. Um, as you know, Mersey travel uh, committee have invested huge sums of money so they'll see the lifts on the north of our stations where they were absolutely inaccessible. We haven't rolled it across the whole network at the moment. Um, in your area, if you've got two um, stations that aren't yet done, they will be on the list. I don't know what the priority of that list is. Perhaps Councillor Lee Robinson will be able to tell you exactly where they're going to. Is now but the idea is and to make every station accessible, Thank you for your every train accessible. But of course, we have got that amount of money to be in this part that we'd all like, so we have to prioritise those. And I don't know what the technological uh, issues of, of doing your stations are, but um, I know somebody who does. It's so, yeah. <coughs> yes, Steve, if we can go back to the half price fares for apprentices, I think it's absolutely brilliant. For a couple of years before, every time a youngster got on the bus, because they won't let me get on the car, I have to go on buses. And they asked for a my ticket, I was like, yes, fabulous. I remember we started off up to 16, then we got it to 19. I remember being asked, are you satisfied? No. Recently I've been talking about the Equal Pay Act, and I think it is fantastic. It was something that was much, much needed. If you relate that now to equality of opportunity, and have a little think about it, once our young people become 16, we treat them as adults, and bus companies and train companies charge them full fare. Now, apprentices, we know get low wages, so do youngsters, right up until the 25th birthday. Some of them may be parents with children at that time. They're still treated and made to pay full fares. Full fares. So my question is, brilliant on the apprentices, will you keep going? So we've got a fair for the other 25 year olds. Easiest answer. Yes, we will keep going, but you're right, uh, Councillor Mary. Uh, what we uh, have done at the moment is to look at the bits that we can most easily affect, but then have a strategic uh, vision of what we want for the transport system in the Liverpool City region. But there's cost, I mean, even to this, there's, there's a cost to it. Um, I'd like to roll that out to, as you say, Every 25 year old. By the way, not every 25 year old is on rubbish money now. I know some people who are 25 who are on more money than most people in, sitting in this room. 
but conversely, there are people who are in the 60 to 67 year age group who get concession to travel. That's only uh, uh, something that you have in our area who are very, very wealthy. So we have to look at where the balance is. The one thing that I don't think any of us wants is mean testing because it just becomes a farce. And actually, to administer it costs you more than you actually get from the system. But we need to find something that's fairer than we've currently got. Uh, and this was the start, I think, of um, it's indicative, isn't it, of the direction of travel that we want to go in. But I agree with you, there are plenty of young people who are on absolutely terrible um, rates of pay and exploited by certain unscrupulous employers who, unfortunately, this doesn't capture. We need to look at what the next stage of this is. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Steve. Uh, 